Hello, welcome to Unit 2, Session 3 of the ACES Aware Ventura County Virtual Lecture Series. We'll give folks just a couple of minutes to log in, and on the screen you'll see a few reminders. Um, the evaluation QR code is here, and um, thank you for joining. We'll get started in just a minute. Thank you for joining. We still have people logging in, so we'll get started in a minute. Um, just a reminder that this lecture is being recorded and you will have access to it on the ACES Aware Ventura County website. And make sure your microphones are muted as you come on in. And while we're reading, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box and share your name and your organization. And we will have a, a drawing for all in attendance for a custom ACES Aware Ventura County prize. And we'll announce the drawing winner in our session follow-up email. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, it will come from the ACES Aware Ventura County email. And in your registration and evaluation, make sure you've noted whether you're requesting continuing education. And if you are seeking continue, continuing education credit, you must be present for the entirety of the session and complete the evaluation to receive the credits. And feel free to introduce yourself. Welcome, I'm Lucy Marrero, and I would like to welcome you to our lecture tonight, the Unit 2, Session 3 um, of our clinical lecture series, Decoding the ACEs Screening Tools and Scores. And before we begin, we'll hear a few words from Dr. Landon. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session that is part of the AAVC Provider Training Lecture Series. We hope this session is both informative and engaging for you. Don't forget to register and complete the evaluation so we know who our audience is and how to improve in the future. All who register, including those who are watching this as a recording, will be entered into a raffle for a special ACEs Aware of Ventura County Prize. This lecture is being recorded so you can have access to it on our website at any time. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Our speakers today are Dr. Melissa Ruiz and Dr. Sarah Hammer. They'll be presenting on decoding the ACEs screening tools and scores. Dr. Ruiz is a pediatrician at the Pediatric Diagnostic Center. She's a child of Peruvian immigrants to whom she's incredibly grateful for giving the gift of bilingualism and for instilling in her a dedication to serve her community. She received her MD from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and completed her master's in public health at the University of Illinois Chicago during her pediatric residency. She serves on the board of the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP, District 9, 
as the Section on Early Career Physicians Representative, as well as the AAP District 9, Chapter 2, Community Access to Child Health, or CATCH, Grant Facilitator. She moved to Ventura in 2016 and immediately fell in love with this community where she's raising her three boys. Dr. Rees started her work around screening for ACEs and unmet social needs in 2014, and she's ecstatic to be a part of this team that's moving this work forward to serve the communities and the families of Ventura County. Dr. Sarah Hemmer is a pediatrician at the American Indian Health and Services in Santa Barbara, California. She's a Chicagoan who was converted to Loving California during her time at Stanford. She returned to Chicago briefly and enjoyed her time at Northwestern University Medical School, but found the winters too cold and decided to settle back in California where her husband is from. She completed her residency at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and then moved to San Francisco where she worked as a pediatrician in an underserved community and began her adverse childhood experiences or ACEs work with Dr. Nadine Burke. She and her husband moved to Santa Barbara in 2013 and she worked at the Pediatric Diagnostic Center in Ventura for seven and a half years. She now works in her hometown of Santa Barbara at American Indian Health and she really enjoys her patient population and loves a chance to speak Spanish with many of her patients. She served on the Santa Barbara Resiliency Project, helping ACEs work become more widespread in Santa Barbara. And she's now thrilled to be a part of ACEs Aware Ventura County. After the lecture, Dr. Ruiz and Dr. Hummer will be responding to your questions and you're encouraged to submit questions via the chat box for our speakers to answer during the Q&A session. And now I'll turn it over to our presentation. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. We are happy to bring to you today's session, Decoding the ACE Screening Tools and Scores. The information in this presentation is adapted from the ACEs Aware Provider Training. So today's learning objectives, at the conclusion of this session, you should be able to define adverse childhood experiences and their prevalence, health disparities in these data, toxic stress response, and the related impacts on health, including the underlying biological mechanisms. Describe the phrasing you can use with patients who are low risk for toxic stress and patients who are high risk for toxic stress. You can describe how you as a primary caregiver can create a joint treatment plan in the prevention identification and treatment of toxic stress. The ACEs Aware mission, to change and save lives by helping providers understand the importance of screening for adverse childhood experiences and training providers to respond with trauma-informed care to mitigate the health impacts of toxic stress. The PEARLS, or Pediatric ACEs and Related Life Events Screener, was developed by the Bay Area Research Consortium on Toxic Stress and Health a partnership between the Center for Youth Wellness, UCSF, and the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. The term adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, comes from the landmark 1998 study conducted among more than 17,000 adult patients by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente. The term ACEs specifically refers to the 10 categories of adversities in three domains experienced by age 18 that were evaluated in the study. The PEARLS Part 1, the ACE screen, includes 10 categories of ACEs in three domains, abuse, neglect, and household challenges. This image, courtesy of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and is another way to visualize the three domains of ACEs, abuse, neglect, and household challenges. In abuse, we see there are three areas, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, within neglect, physical or emotional neglect, and household challenges. Things like growing up in a household with parental incarceration, mental illness, substance dependence, or absence due to parental separation or divorce, or intimate partner violence. Here is the actual PEARLS Part 1 ACE screen for the child, which is completed by their caregiver. The score can range from zero to 10. The introduction to the screener is in the gray box. It says, at any point in time since your child was born, has your child seen or been present when the following experiences happened? 
please include past and present experiences. Please note some questions have more than one part separated by or. If any part of the question is answered yes, then the answer to the entire question is yes. So I'm gonna run through the 10 ACEs so we all know exactly what questions our patients are being asked. Number one, has your child ever lived with a parent who went to jail? Number two, do you think your child ever felt unsupported, unloved, or unprotected? Number three, has your child ever lived with a parent who had a mental health issue? Number four, has a caregiver ever insulted, humiliated, or put down your child? Number five, has the child's biological parent or any caregiver ever had or currently has a problem with too much alcohol, street drugs, or prescription medication use? Number six, has your child ever lacked appropriate care by any caregiver? Number seven, has your child ever seen or heard a parent or caregiver being screamed at, sworn at, insulted, or humiliated by another adult? Or has your child ever seen or heard a parent or caregiver being slapped, kicked, punched, beaten up, or hurt with a weapon? Has, number eight, has any adult in the household often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or thrown something at your child? Or has any adult in the household ever hit your child so hard that your child had marks or was injured? Or has any adult in the household ever threatened your child or acted in a way that made your child afraid that they might be hurt? Number nine, has your child ever experienced sexual abuse? Number 10, have there ever been significant changes in the relationship status of the child's caregivers? And there's a part two that comes with the ACEs screening. The part two uh, has to do with the other adversities that may be risk factors for toxic stress. And the importance of screening for this is it's going to get into some of the unmet social needs your patients might be experiencing. Uh, and it's not included in the original ACE score uh, because as we'll describe, there's a lot of data around the ACE score and health disparities and health outcomes. There's not data how these other unmet social needs impact uh, health outcomes, but we know they're related and there's ongoing research around this area, uh, but it's not directly correlated to the data yet. And so we don't include it in that original ACE score part one screener. Uh, these questions have to do with community violence, food and housing insecurity, bullying, discrimination, and caregivers' physical illness or death. And I will go through all the questions here. So again, you understand what questions are being asked of your patients. The specific questions in the pearls part two include, has your child ever seen, heard, or been a victim of violence in your neighborhood, community, or school? Has your child ever experienced discrimination? Has your child ever had problems with housing? Have you ever worried that your child did not have enough food to eat or that the food for your child would run out before you could buy more? Has your child ever lived with a parent caregiver who had a serious physical illness or disability? Has your child ever been separated from the parent or care caregiver due to foster care or immigration? Has your child ever lived with a parent or caregiver who died? I actually had a teenage girl who I saw soon after we had started screening. Her ACE score was not very high, but the, this screener showed up uh, that she had been experiencing discrimination and really wanted to speak about it and was very open about her experience and felt very validated when we discussed that experience. So even though she did not have a high ACE score, it was a very important moment for the patient-doctor relationship for me to understand where she was coming from and for her to feel heard in that, in that moment. And so I think, uh, I, I think these questions are critical to finding out more about what's going on with your patient and connecting them to the, to the appropriate resources. The PEARLS is available in child, teen, and teen self-report formats. Each of these is also available in a de-identified, identified, and a de-identified part one and two format, which I'll explain in the next slides. In the identified screens, the respondents specify which ACE their child has experiences, experienced and total them up to give a final ACE score. The PEARLS is also available in 17 languages on the acesaware.org website. Here is an example of the identified child pearls. The caregiver is prompted in the purple box to please check yes to the items that apply and then total the number of yes answers at the end. 
In the identified screens, respondents specify exactly which ACE their child has had. Here's an example of the de-identified teen pearls. The caregiver is not prompted to mark yes to the items that apply, but rather to add up the total yes answers at the end. So you can see that in the de-identified screen, respondents count the number of ACE categories from a list and document only a total score. This is the de-identified part one and identified part two teen self-report pearls. According to the Bay Area Resource Consortium on Toxic Stress and Health, investigators' personal communication from 2019 as cited in the ACEs Aware provided training, the implementation pilots of the PEARLS tool indicate that the de-identified format may facilitate higher rates of disclosure and greater patient comfort. Some clinics may like this format because it may allow you to identify exactly what resource referrals are needed on um, the unmet social needs or part two, but may allow the parent to not specify exactly which ACE their child has experienced. And while I was very well of this data when we started and we started with a de-identified screener, we've actually found anecdotally in our experience in our clinic uh, that parents actually end up writing yes and no, uh, and even though they don't have a checkbox to check off. So I have been leaning towards moving towards the identified screener just because I think parents are spending a lot of time writing yes and no. Uh, and I think they're still ending up disclosing a lot of the ACEs uh, in a way to communicate that to their providers. So the ACE screen for adults from ACEs Aware is slightly different and it's introduced on the screener in the yellow box. It says our relationships and experiences, even those in childhood, can affect our health and well being. Difficult experiences are very common. Please tell us whether you have had any of the experiences listed below, as they may affect your health today or may affect your health in the future. This information will help you and your provider better understand how to work together to support your health and well being. The instructions ask the adult patient to check mark next to the ACE that they experienced prior to their 18th birthday. The ACE questionnaire for adults is also available in a de-identified format if patients do not want to specify each ACE they have experienced. At the end of the screen, the adult is asked if they believe the experiences have affected his or her health. They are reassured that experiences in childhood are just one part of a person's life story and asked to let their provider know if they have any concerns about privacy when completing the screen. As opposed to the adult screener, children are living experiences year by year. Uh, and so we are going to be screening children on an ongoing basis until their 18th birthday. The uh, schedule that we've come up with our clinic is something adapted from the recommendations from ACEs Aware. And we do screen at four month well child check, at the 15 month well child check, 30 month well child check, and then annually after the four years of age at each well child check. A critical piece to introducing the screener, because they are very heavy questions, uh, is training the staff. And so we actually made sure to train our staff and give them a script that, that they have now become comfortable with. Uh, but it's really important to give them uh, the background, empower them with the information, and then give them the tool to, by which to introduce the tool. Uh, so one possible MA script, uh, which was suggested in the ACEs Aware Provider Training Case 1, we have a few forms for you to fill out about your child's health and development. One of the forms asks about exposures to adverse childhood experiences or stressful or traumatic events in childhood. We have started to ask all of our families about them because these experiences are very common and because we now understand that they can affect children's health and development. In filling out this form, please add up the total number of categories that apply to your child, but you do not have to specify which ones. This would be introducing a de-identified screener. The doctor will answer any questions that you have about the forms, and I'm here if you need clarification on the instructions. So in terms of a workflow, and this has been something that's been ongoing for over the last year in our clinic, uh, and is 
has to be adapted for each clinic, right? <clears throat> this is something that's worked within our workflow. We've actually implemented some work into our EMR, uh, but I'll go over what kind of the basic framework would look like. Um, the workflow starts when the staff reviews a patient's record and determines if the Pearl screener is indicated at that visit. It's actually built into our health maintenance EMR, so our MA is actually alerted that they are due for a, an ACEs screen. When the form is completed, the MA or provider can transcribe the score from the part one into the EMR. That is what's transcribed and that is what's billed on. So zero to 10, that's it. We don't transcribe part two. Uh, the provider then reviews the screen with the patient and the family. And the provider then documents the ACE score, the billing code and the treatment plan in the note. The billing code is based on low risk score or high risk score, that's it. Lastly, the provider should review the ACE score, treatment plan, and follow up prior to the next visit or at the next visit and update it as needed. How this ends up working in your workflow is you know, adjustable and adaptable as all the things are in our clinics. Uh, but we have found that um, getting that score in actually ends up prompting a billing prompt. Uh, and we are able to then bill and build it into our order set. So it, it keeps a pretty seamless uh, process. This algorithm pertains to the ACE score part one of the furls, which has associations with health conditions that are known. So a low risk score is considered a score of zero. An intermediate risk score is considered a score of zero to three without associated health conditions. And a high risk score in red is considered a score of zero, excuse me, a score of one to three with associated health conditions or a score of four or more with or without associated health conditions. If the patient does not complete the screener but is identified as either intermediate or high risk, then you would just want to follow that category. For an A score between of zero, the clinician should educate parents about ACEs and provide anticipatory guidance about toxic stress, buffering factors, and interventions to prevent toxic stress. When I first started doing ACEs screening, I was very worried about not having a specific answer or solution to a positive ACE score. I've since learned that education around ACEs themselves and the potential negative effects of ACEs and ways to combat these negative effects and talk about resilience with our patients is a great intervention in itself. The score of one to three with uh, out associated health conditions is intermediate risk. In this case, we wanna provide education about toxic stress and resilience, assess for perfect protective factors in the family, jointly formulate a treatment plan and link to support services and treatment as appropriate. For our high risk patients with a score of one to three with associated health conditions or an ACEs score of four or more, we also wanna provide education and assess for protective factors and joint, uh, jointly formulate a treatment plan and link them to support and treatment services. You may be wondering what the ACE associated health conditions that we are referring to in the previous algorithm are. This chart summarizes research that has been associated with high ACE scores with health conditions such as asthma, allergies, obesity, learning and behavioral concerns. Of particular note, for patients with more than three ACEs, somatic symptoms like nausea, vomiting, dizziness, constipation, headaches, all can be associated. Not surprisingly, sleep disturbances are also common. This table and its citations are available in the ACE screening clinical workflows on the acesaware.org website. In the mental health domain, ADHD, depression, anxiety, age at first use of illicit drugs, high school absenteeism are all strongly associated conditions for patients with more than four ACEs as compared to no ACEs. So you can see that there is quite a health disparity depending on how many ACEs you have. While ACEs are known to be associated with elevated risk for poor physical health, they are also associated with many mental health conditions such as ADHD, anxiety, and depression. 
By evaluating for ACEs, we can help our patients better identify any toxic stress in their life and see the connection between toxic stress and physical and mental health. Interestingly, research has shown that experiencing more than four ACEs relative to no ACEs substantially increases the risk for at least nine of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. This table and its cited resources can also be found at the ACEs Aware Provider Training Case 1 discussion. In adulthood, the number of ACE categories experienced is associated with increased cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, liver disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, risky sexual behaviors, early and high-risk substance abuse, depression, suicidality, poor self-related health, and premature mortality. ACEs have also been associated in a dose response fashion with poor educational and social outcomes, substantially increased likelihood of learning behavioral developmental concerns, requiring special education, not completing high school, low life satisfaction, food or housing insecurity, arrest, living below the poverty line. And so here we are gonna start talking about what are we gonna do with these ACE screeners? Because we know that ACEs are associated with uh, poorer health outcomes, higher ACE scores are associated with poorer health outcomes. And now we have a patient in our office filling out a screener. We need to have an approach to how to deal with that score. And one of the approaches that we went with was the Ask, Tell, Ask, which is a uh, motivational interviewing tool. And here we have adapted this to fit our needs and created this tool to help when interacting with patients and families. And this tool will be available to you uh, with all the script recommendations uh, to give you a place to start from. So when we're looking at this framework, it's, we find it's a useful tool to utilize as a model, but it's not rigid. And these conversations can take many forms and directions depending on the context. So keeping in mind that referrals are not the only response for patients at risk for toxic stress, we really wanna talk about educating and empowering families. So we'll go through a series of these ask, tell, ask models, uh, first starting with a low risk A score of zero. So the idea behind the ask, tell, ask model is that you're asking permission to discuss the screener. I have families that have asked me not to talk about these questions. We have to respect that uh, and thank them for being upfront about their discomfort with these questions and move forward from that conversation. When I ask the family, I start saying, is it okay if we talk about this form for a minute? Or thank you for filling out this form. Have you seen a form like this before? What questions do you have? And then we start talking about why we gave them a form. So thank you for sharing this information. We are asking these questions because we now understand that exposure to stressful or traumatic experience like the ones listed here may affect the amount of stress hormones that a child's body makes. And this can increase their risk for health and developmental problems. And then we will go on to say, I see that your child has not experienced any of these events. Is that correct? Because research shows that early intervention improves outcomes. Will you let us know if in the future your child experiences any of these events? I also take a moment because there is that part two addressing unmet social needs to make sure that families know that we are a resource, that we are here to support them and to connect them to the resources that may be out there for them. And to really make sure that we're taking care of not only that child, the whole child, but the whole family. And so then when we go on to an intermediate risk ACE score of one to three without an associate, ACE associated health risk condition, we're gonna add on to that tell part. So we do the same asking permission to discuss the ACE score. We tell them why we gave them the screener. But now we start talking a little bit about those protective factors and we'll go into a little more detail in a minute. But my, my general script would be some of the things that have been shown to help children with stress response include things like good nutrition, healthy sleep, spending time in nature, regular exercise, mental health support, mindfulness, and healthy relationships. And then at the end, uh, I will ask them, do you think that any of these stressors are affecting your child now? 
uh, I saw that your child has experienced some stressors. Is that correct? And then we talk about how we can make a plan around the factors that are already protecting that child in their current situation and how we can maybe increase those protective factors. Then when we're talking about a higher risk score, I add on a possible referral to a community resource or a, a treatment plan and follow-up plan with that family. When we're talking about an unknown risk score, we're talking about someone who didn't fill it out, fill it out incompletely. And that happens a lot with my young children because the children are running around the office and the parent can't possibly fill out the 10 forms we just gave them. Uh, so then we stop and just talk about the form, talk about the resources that are available. And often my families uh, do end up disclosing uh, certain needs that they may have or certain issues they've been having with some behavioral issues with their children. So we're gonna talk about a certain case. This is a five-year-old uh, a five-year-old girl. She has a headache. She's been having headaches. We've ruled out any of the scary causes of headaches. And we find that she actually has a high A score. And Sarah's gonna uh, play the role of mom. And I'm gonna go over how I would finish up a session because we wanna go through that ask, tell, ask. And then we really wanna make sure that there's a clear treatment plan and follow-up plan. So now that we've gone over the treatment plan and the follow-up plan, how confident you, how confident are you between zero to ten that you think we can uh, move forward with this treatment plan? I think I'm about a six. Okay. And what do you think would maybe get your score of your confidence score a little bit higher, maybe like to an eight? Well, I think if you could explain to me exactly how those referral services are going to be met and how they're going to contact me so I can understand how it all happened. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to make sure that our case manager or social worker reaches out to you in the next two to three days. So if you don't hear from them, I want to make sure that you would be able to call us and let us know that you haven't heard from them. Do you think yeah. you'd be able to do that? Yeah, I think we could do that. Great. Uh, and then does it work for us to follow up in, let's say, a month and check in and see how all of this is working out? Well, we're pretty busy, so I think maybe more like six weeks to two months will work better for me. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And I think it makes sense to make sure that it's something that you guys can actually do and not set up something that we're not able to complete. And then what kind of, you know, we talked about some of those protective strategies, right? Um, healthy sleep, um, healthy eating, being out in nature. What, what of those strategies do you think you could implement uh, to help your child? Well, I think we could be better about nutrition at home and we all want to eat less chips and less snacking. <laughs> sure. And maybe with that, we could try and get out and hike a little bit more as a family. Wonderful. And then something I wanted to bring you um, to make you more aware of the, the, on that website that I had mentioned, um, there are different strategies. And so we'll go over a couple of the strategies. One of them to bring down our anxiety at times is actually the color strategy. It's something that I learned when I was learning more about ACEs, um, but it's something where you go around uh, and just pick one color and find every item in the room of that color. And it's something we could practice with your child right now. And it's just a really nice concrete way to uh, bring down our, our anxiety levels and something you can do anywhere you are. Um, another one that I really like talking about with families is the breathing butterfly. Uh, and it's a, it's a YouTube uh, video. It's a couple minutes long, but you can find it pretty much everywhere. Um, and you can just watch it with your child and it really helps calm them down because it shows them how to breathe and you breathe with this beautiful butterfly and it helps bring down their anxiety levels and calm them as well. I'm so sure they love it since it's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. So, <laughs> so these are uh, resources that are available to, um, to all of you. Uh, there are a few other resources on our website as well, but those are two that I actually use in clinical practice regularly now uh, because I found them to be useful not only for my patients but for my own children and for myself. So now we're going to start talking more about resilience. So on the ACEs AWARE website, resilience is defined as the ability to withstand or recover from stressors and results from a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic factors as well as predisposing biologic susceptibility. Of note, with scientific advances in the understanding of the impact of stress on neuroendocrine, immune, and genetic regulatory health, we must advance our understanding of resilience 
as also having neuroendocrine immune and genetic regulatory domains. ACEs are not destiny. Accumulating positive experiences during childhood can buffer the developing brain and body from the harmful effects of stress. In other words, they build resilience. Here is a resource that emphasizes resilience and has useful tools for people to use, like the iChill app. Check out one of our future sessions in Unit 3 to learn more about the Community Resilience Model. This model will be explained in more detail in a later presentation within the series. When we talk about protective factors, we talk about intrinsic or extrinsic conditions or attributes that may decrease the risk for toxic stress. Some of the intrinsic factors are things like curiosity and learning, ability to pay attention, ability to regulate emotions and behavior, and even biologic factors like differences in telomere length and serotonin transporter genes. In fact, in a large UK study, an always available adult or someone that the patient could trust and talk to about any personal problems actually buffered the impact of ACEs on harmful health behaviors. Studies have also shown that a nurturing caregiver, and these are in the extrinsic factors realm, um, buffer stress and the probability of intergenerational transmission of ACEs impacts. Having a sense of belonging in school and in the community is also an extrinsic protective factor. So whether you decide to use the ask, tell, ask model uh, or develop your own way to approach uh, working with the ACE screener, the summary of your treatment plan for the ACEs and toxic stress should follow some of these kind of basic guidelines. So you wanna educate families, you wanna talk about those protective factors and the existing strengths, because you really wanna validate uh, what those families are doing right for their kids, because otherwise they're gonna leave that visit feeling very despondent. Um, so you really wanna talk about what's going well for that family. Uh, you may need to make a referral, depending on if it's a higher risk score or if there's an ACE-associated health condition. You definitely wanna have the family involved in that formulation of the treatment plan, and you wanna recommend evidence-based strategies for mitigating toxic stress. And we've gone over some of those evidence-based strategies and we'll go over them again at the end to make sure you have them in your mind. And this uh, clinical response overview is essentially what we just discussed, but this is what's gonna be available to you uh, on the ACEs Aware website. You can make sure to go through and make sure you have all those pieces. And they talk about those um, and remind you of those evidence-based uh, protective factors such as balanced nutrition, regular physical activity, experiencing nature, uh, and you know, making sure kids are outside. As a reminder, this clinical algorithm is also really helpful. I keep it by my desk um, to help us remember what is considered a high score and what type of intervention we should be doing for each score. These are the evidence-based strategies for mitigating toxic stress. And this wheel is kind of a nice way to represent to our families what we can be doing, things like nutrition, physical activity, mindfulness. So this is a colorful tool that you could print out and hand to your families about building resilience. And we do really wanna focus on the strengths in our families and how we build resilience after we've identified ACEs in the family. When we talk about referrals, uh, when we're talking about, not every referral is gonna be a therapy referral. And I think that's a big misconception about when we talk about referrals around ACEs. Some referrals are gonna be to a boys and girls club, to an after school program, uh, to a sporting uh, activity. Uh, but when we talk about some referrals, some, some are gonna be therapy and some specific uh, therapies that are, that are uh, designed to help children with trauma are parent-child interaction therapy or PCIT, cognitive behavioral therapy and family therapy. And so we do wanna see if we can find providers in your areas that provide those and really focus on, on um, kids who have experienced trauma. Uh, there also be family resource referrals uh, for that support those seven evidence-based strategies. In fact, we were just part of a pilot program uh, helping use some clinical, clinical navigators in Ventura County. Uh, and those clinical navigators were from zero to five were from Help Me Grow. And then the five and over went to partnerships for safe families. And so that was really a nice pilot 
that uh, is hopefully going to be growing into something that's you know, available to anyone in Ventura County. And for those outside of Ventura County, you can start kind of seeing what organizations and what community resources and community organizations might be available for that clinical navigation piece and that connecting piece to the community resources that might help uh, buffer some of those ACEs. So one of the, the ways we wanna kind of finish this out is thinking about cases. And for those of you who've already done your ACEs Aware training, thank you for doing it. Uh, and you know now you can bill. Uh, uh, but you went through one of these cases likely, especially if you're a pediatrician, you probably chose pediatric cases like I did. Uh, but this actually was this 33-month-old boy with failure to thrive and had an ACE score of seven. This was a, a case in there. I had a case almost identical, uh, but I'll tack on that my child, my patient, had um, chronic constipation as well. And we did a pretty extensive workup. Uh, we didn't really find much. And mom ended up uh, really asking, in one of the hospitalizations, asking for therapy for herself. And when she asked for therapy for herself and actually took time and took a FMLA and was home with him uh, for an extended period of time, they both did so much better. Um, the child started gaining weight, the child's constipation improved, uh, and we really found that, number one, a healthy caregiver is critical, and then a healthy caregiver that the child could count on was really critical. And so the caregiver has to manage their own stress before they can help that child manage their, their stress. Um, there was a referral to um, uh, parent-child interactive th interaction therapy for that family, um, and I think that's been very helpful. And I've seen some, you know, back and forth because this is a child that does live in two homes. We don't, we can't control that, um, and mom can't control what's going on necessarily in the other home. And so that's something that we've had to work with within the family as well. And that's why one of the aces is separation from a caregiver. Uh, but it's really important to ha ensure that those caregivers are taking care of themselves uh, before they can really uh, fully take care of, of their child. And finding out that ACE score and really understanding that background of that child helped me get that family uh, to a place where that child is now thriving. So case four from the Becoming ACE Aware training really spoke to me. It's about an eight-year-old boy named Ethan who is having more anger outbursts and increased asthma exacerbations. He lands in the emergency room with his dad because his inhaler was at his mom's and he had a bad asthma exacerbation. He was also having difficulty getting along with kids at school and being more aggressive there. His parents had been recently divorced and he was now living between two households. So it's likely that Ethan is experiencing increased stress hormones because of the changes in his family circumstance. And this is also triggering a flare of his asthma. Let's look at one of the ways our body's main stress response happens, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA access. This is in the pictorial graphic on the slide. So we receive a danger signal from the limbic system where emotion, behavior, long-term memory is controlled. This triggers the hypothalamus to secrete corticotropin-releasing hormone. Then the anterior pituitary responds to the CRH and secretes ACTH, in turn causing the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol, the fight or flight hormone that increases our heart rate, our blood pressure, allows us to run for the hills when the bear is coming at us or something's chasing us. Also, the parasympathetic and sympathetic portions of our autonomic nervous system contribute to our stress response by downregulating the vagal nerve, allowing more sympathetic tone. In asthma specifically, stress causes downregulation of glucocorticoid receptors, reducing the effectiveness of cortisol. Stress also causes increased cytokine response to triggers like allergens in the environment, all leading to more lung inflammation. So when stress is well-regulated, cortisol feeds back negatively on the HPA axis and the system resets. But during prolonged toxic stress, there's increased activation of our HPA axis, high cortisol levels, and this changes the function of the developing limbic system in our kids and ultimately leads to differences in learning, memory, executive function, increased anxiety, poor self-regulation. 
In this case, Ethan's increased family stress probably has worsened his asthma via the neuroendocrine immune pathway. We can help Ethan as caregivers for Ethan to decrease his level of toxic stress by fostering good communication between his homes. There are communication apps out there that can help, medication forms that can go between two homes, and we can encourage the parents to have consistent routines for Ethan. And maybe in this way, we can decrease Ethan's anger response and possibly ultimately improve his asthma. So hopefully at this point, uh, we've fulfilled these learning objectives. We've gone over some practical ways uh, on how to approach these ACEs screeners, giving you some tools. Uh, definitely uh, reach out to our website and check out the different scripts because I think those can be really helpful. And at first, you really just have to work on kind of practicing them. And then over time, I think they become more second nature, just like everything else we do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rees and Dr. Hammer for that informative presentation. I'm going to take a few moments to um, go over some important reminders about ACES training, certification, and screening. Um, clinical team members who bill Medi-Cal must complete a certified ACES Aware core training and complete the attestation that they completed the training to qualify for payment through Medi-Cal for conducting those ACES screenings. And that training is the Becoming ACES Aware in California that you just heard about. It's a, a free two-hour training. It's online that certifies eligible clinicians to receive payment. Um, and you can receive two continuing medical education or CME credits, two MOC credits uh, for completing that training. Okay, we're gonna start the Q&A portion of this presentation and you're encouraged to submit your questions via the chat box uh, and our presenters will answer during this time or you can use the raise your hand function and we'll call on you and ask you to unmute um, and keep on typing your questions into the chat box as we go along. Thank you, doctors. Um, we do have some questions that um, had come in uh, in advance. So I'd like to go ahead and start with those while the questions start to roll in. Um, someone has asked, what's your experience been with the identified and de-identified screening tools? And are there certain situations where you would recommend using one over the other? Uh, I can start with that. And I think I alluded to that during the presentation. Um, we are currently using the de-identified because um, some of the studies that, that are out there um, show that that caregivers feel a little bit um, more apt to disclose um, if they don't have to necessarily uh, show what their ACE is. Um, however, as I mentioned, 95%, if not more, of my patients end up writing yes and no. And so that... Um, it, it sort of negates the purpose, right? So I've been inclined to switch over to the identified because then they would just check a box, yes and no. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. And so I, that's been just my personal experience so far. But I know studies have shown us that using the de-identified would, would kind of work better, um, but that hasn't been my, my experience. And, and they tend to even identify, like if they, start, if they say yes, um, child lives with a caregiver, with a mental health diagnosis, they will even put in like anxiety or depression. Um, they tend to they tend to actually want to tell me more than less. Yeah, I mean it's understandable. Sometimes this is the first time that they've talked to anybody about this, right? Dr. Hammer, do you want to share your experiences? Yeah, I I actually really like the de-identified part one for the ACEs and then the identified part two so that um, you can really um, address the unmet social needs right away, but also give them, uh, the parent, a little bit of space to um, 
feel comfortable, um, you know, just giving a total ACE score rather than feeling the pressure of, of necessarily identifying which ACE their child has experiencing experience and needing to go into that um, at that particular visit. But I do like to really know what those unmet social needs are right away. Yeah, that really makes sense in terms of being able to follow up with a resource. And Sheila's asked, how frequently do you rescreen if a caregiver declines the pearls? Well, I guess it depends why they decline it. If they just are stressed because their toddlers are running around the room and they need to get to another appointment, um, then I'd be more likely to ask, would you be okay with us asking you these questions again in the future? Um, and probably try again at the next well child visit. Um, but if a parent really feels like it's a, um, takes it personally, which unfortunately sometimes people can feel like it's too personal, um, then maybe giving them a little bit of space and just talking about stressors in the home in a different way would be my approach. Thank you. I think for us, um, we, you know, it's actually put into our EMR now. And so it's kind of a yearly. Well, I gave that, I gave the um, periodicity schedule, right? So it's like four months and then um, 18 months and et cetera. But basically it's once a year um, when they're you know under 18. Um, and so I think for us, it would just go to the next year. And so we would try again with the, when it pops up again, like that it was declined. Um, I mean, I agree with Sarah. Like if, if, I, if I remember and I know that, oh, you know, that was not the right visit, but let's try again, we'll do that. Um, but I think kind of on a routine, it'd probably be just the next year. Thank you. We have a question from Chaz. What's your experience been with caregivers who are worried about mandated reporting as a result of disclosures? Uh, that's come up very little um, in my practice. I think um, it's a big concern of a lot of ours that that will happen regularly. Um, maybe potentially because I've used a de-identified screen a lot of the time. Um, and if, and if um, abuse has come up, a lot of the times it's already been reported. Um, there's a rare circumstance where it's a new abuse that we need to report that day. But that's a, a couple of times in, in many years of doing this screener that I've experienced that. Yeah, I would say the same. And I think that's definitely something that I've heard uh, as a concern, obviously, and I had my own concerns back even when I started um, some of this work, like, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, so certainly, um, you know, we don't, I mean, we, we want to know, right? We, we want to, we want to report that if that's happening. Um, I don't think, uh, yeah, I, ha I haven't really had it come up as, as something I have had, you know, I've had parents decline it and I don't, I don't know why, right? I, we can delve in a little bit. Um, sometimes they don't really want to talk about it. Um, and so I have to just kind of keep my, um, my spidey senses up when I see those kids. Yeah, thank you. And please continue to ask questions of the chat or uh, use the raise your hand. I've got a couple more here. Um, so someone has asked, since the part two of the pearls form isn't scored, how do you suggest addressing anything that comes up in that section? So kind of to your point, Dr. Hammer, about, you know, the identified versus the identified in part two. I know for us, I mean, and this is where I'm very spoiled and I have a social worker in my clinic, so it's a, it is easier. And I, I, I recognize that's not the majority of um, providers out there. Uh, you know, if it's a food insecurity issue, because um, that's one of the questions on there, um, I can have my social worker reach out with uh, food resources. Um, but those are those are things that um, before I when I worked in clinics that didn't have social workers, um, I I just started building my own resource sheets, right? And and it's not ideal that I, I hand them something and and um, they go off. Ideally, we have navigators and we're starting to kind of build that network in Ventura County. So hopefully we'll have more of that. Um, so we can actually do more of a warm handoff to a navigator who can help connect those families to resources. Um, but kind of, it, kind of those initial times is, is having some resources on hand, having a handout on CalFresh, having a handout on the local food banks, um, et cetera, right? Uh, um, community violence, just addressing it. I, I mentioned that patient who told me um, that her, her and her mother had been, you know, called racist names in the mall parking lot in Ventura, right? Uh, and, 
and just talking about it, I, that for her, that was enough. Like, I think she just needed to hear that, that that was a traumatic event um, and be validated that 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 was hard for her and that that shouldn't have happened. Um, so I think sometimes it's something as simple as that, that intervention of the, during the visit. And you can, I agree with everything um, Dr. Reese said. And I think in the past when I've had uh, a higher score on a de-identified part two, I'd say to the family, I see that you um, had a score of three on part two. Are you comfortable sharing with me what areas um, were of concern for your family here? And then be able to make the referral that day if, if, if they want one. Yeah, that's great. And it kind of goes back to the ask, tell, ask, right? You know, is it okay if, if you tell me more about that? And then I've got some resources for you if that's okay. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. So continue to uh, ask any questions you think of. I've got another one here. Um, a struggle I've seen is knowing where to start when trying to implement ACEs screenings on a large scale? And how would you suggest getting started, especially given all the moving parts and the limited time that providers and staff have? Well, I think when we started at the PDC, um, Melissa and I started screening um, first before some of the other providers in our pediatric clinic um, to see how workflows would go. And we had trained our particular staff on our side of the clinic Mm -hmm. um, and that worked really nicely. I think some practices um, will be better suited training everyone at the same time. And so the patients are all receiving that questionnaire at the same time. And some offices may feel more comfortable with that um, uh, approach so that everyone in the clinic is aware of what's happening at the same time. I think we at PVC, we also had communication um, with all the providers that we were doing it. So everyone kind of knew what was happening. And I think that that helps a lot, um, but not everyone started at the same time. Yeah, and I would emphasize that piece of, I, I think the biggest barrier is getting your staff trained because I think that's critical. And I, I don't think it's right to start without doing that and really taking the time to train your staff. Um, chances are a lot of our staff have their own ACE scores. Uh, and so making sure we address that and, um, and, and they kind of recognize and have the buy-in to see why this is important to be asking families. Um, if families have a negative reaction, like our staff should understand why we're asking. Um, so, um, so we definitely wanna make sure they feel empowered uh, with some of those answers and, and know why it's important. I think once I trained my medical assistant, she totally got it. And she definitely um, bought into the idea that this was important to be asking in these visits. Um, but it is, it is a barrier and we still, I mean, we're still struggling <laughs> at the PDC with getting all the staff trained, um, you know, a lot because of COVID and pandemic and then staffing issues now, but, um, but it is, it's a struggle. Uh, but I think, you know, even if you can roll it out with one provider at a time, it's worth it. Yeah, that really makes sense. And I love what you said about the why, you know, really understanding the importance of this and getting that buy-in to participate in the process, even when it gets a little sticky. Um, and I know um, some of our future sessions will focus on resilience and you know how to work with your own ACEs scores and experiences when you um, are doing this work. So I'm um, looking forward to that. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Uh, so the Ask Till Ask tool seems really helpful. Definitely something that I can take back to my team. Um, is there a way to get this? And are there any other tools for our staff and patients? Yeah, there are a ton of resources on the website. And if you haven't taken a look at the website, it's very worth um, looking at, um, even if you're not in the county, but if, certainly if you're in the county, there's a lot of local resources as well. But all the tools are available there. Um, the scripts, the scripts for your medical assistant, the scripts for yourself. Um, sorry, my cat is being insane behind me. Um, uh, but it's all there for the taking um, and, uh, you know, as well as these presentations will be there as well, but um, all, all of the resources are on the website. Thank you. Yes, I think it's a treasure. Um, if you check out the provider resources and then there are resources also for parents and for individuals as well, including um, Breathing Butterfly and, and all of those great things. Um, thank you everybody for your great questions. I hope this has uh, helped people become more comfortable with the screening tools, implementing the screening in practice, 
and how to address different scores uh, that come up. Thank you so much, Dr. Rees, Dr. Hammer, for speaking today. Um, and everyone, please stay on for just a minute for some important reminders from the Landon Pediatric Foundation ACES grant coordinators. Thank you. Thank you again for watching this lecture. Remember to complete the registration and evaluation. We will contact you soon if you are one of our raffle winners, so stay tuned. Make sure to follow us on all our social media accounts and subscribe on our webpage for more information of our 12 lecture series, ACES Aware Ventura County, and all things ACES Aware. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Bye, Bye. see you at our next session. Thank you all for joining and thank you again, Dr. Hammer and Dr. Ruiz. Um, it was a pleasure and thank you, Lucy, uh, for moderating this session. Um, feel free to visit our website again. We continue to plug that, but that is where we have all of our information about the uh, lecture series and upcoming sessions, as well as many of the resources that we talked about today. Um, and please remember to complete the evaluation as well. We'll send a reminder email after this, uh, after this evening um, with the evaluation link, as well as our drawing winner for tonight. So thank you again so much, and we'll see you at the next session.